Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. Great. Don't forget your coffee. Great. I, I'm going to talk uh, briefly uh, today about uh, open educational resources for health. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start from ground zero. I, I apologize to those of you who have, uh, who know a little bit about this already, um, but I will move through that part rather quickly. Um, open educational resources uh, are a type of educational material, um, and I, I drew this graph, to, uh, this, this diagram, just so you could get a sense of what it is and what it is not. Um, open educational resources uh, is not uh, e-learning materials. E-learning materials are essentially anything you can put on the computer and distribute widely by a disk or by the internet. Um, uh, E-learning materials, some of which are open, um, and by open I mean things that are freely available for anyone to use. And freely available can be freely available on the internet. They can also be freely available distributed to you as either uh, instructions or distributed to you in a, a piece of paper. Um, it's simply open and freely available without cost um, and with limited restrictions, and I'll talk about those restrictions in a minute. Um, but many e-learning materials are free, and some of them, in fact, aren't. You may have heard the term open courseware. Um, open courseware, I see, is a subset of the bigger picture of open education resources. Open courseware is actually course material. It's lectures, it's, uh, it's uh, things that you might use to manage. It's course management software, for those of you who use um, things like that. Um, this is a subset of the bigger picture of, of open educational resources. Um, let me give you a, some samples of what open educational resources are. Here's one. Um, this is from Google Books, um, which you can uh, identify, uh, you can uh, ask it to select for only those things which are freely available in full text format. Um, and this is the number one uh, identified uh, uh, item in the subject medicine, um, which is uh, Sir William Osler's uh, text. Um, but uh, that's free. Uh, anybody can use it. You can use it for any lectures that you want. It's, it has no copyright associated with it because he died more than 70 years ago. That's one of the, that's one of the aspects of the copyright law. Here's another thing you can use. You can, this is an open image. It's uh, from Gray's Anatomy. Again, uh, uh, Professor Gray died many years ago and the book was published too many years ago to still be under copyright. So um, if you want to use the rather expensive uh, NetERP images, you can. Um, and you can pay the copyright for it, or you can go on the internet and grab the free uh, Gray's images and use those instead. Um, similarly, there are courses, uh, and these are PowerPoints, they're videos, uh, and MIT is the founder of, of, of doing this. They, they've done more of it, I think, than anybody else, um, and uh, uh, you can go to OCW, that stands for opencourseware.mit.edu, and uh, listen to the world's most famous lecture on, on uh, physics. Um, I think, uh, uh, and uh, people from all over the world have done this. Um, you can go and listen to these lectures. You can't get course credit for it. Um, you can't get an MIT degree, um, but you can listen to most courses at MIT um, on the internet, uh, either by looking at the PowerPoint slides or many of them are full, uh, are full videos. Um, uh, this is an example, and Mary Lee will talk about this a little more in, more in a minute. This is not just courses. This is also course management software um, and materials like that. So this is also an open source type of a thing. Um, uh, you can also move beyond simple uh, PowerPoints and lecture materials to interactive activities. This is the Eyes Have It, which is a great tool for medical students and even for residents uh, uh, created by Jonathan Trobe out of the University of Michigan. Um, which is an open and freely available course on what to do with uh, someone who comes in with a red eye um, and uh, basic uh, primary care information about uh, what to do with someone with a red eye. It's got an instructional mode um, if you want to learn or you can quiz yourself right here. Again, all free, freely available for anybody to use anywhere in the world that's got access to an internet connection can have that. Um, this is a, this is a uh, piece of open educational resource. This is, um, a, uh, uh, a maternal hemorrhage, a postpartum hemorrhage simulator uh, created by uh, Pam Andriata and, and her colleagues, our colleagues at the, uh, in Ghana. Um, and uh, the instructions for how to build this thing for $200 and train people how to prevent maternal uh, postpartum hemorrhage, um, which she's presented in a couple of abstracts, uh, uh, posters during the uh, proceedings uh, are all also available. It is an open educational resource. Uh, because it's freely available for anybody to learn how to use. It's not proprietary. 
Um, so uh, why is it open? It's open because it's educational. Um, uh, it's built for reuse, and some, but not all, of the, co of the rights of it uh, can be reserved. And this is based on an idea that was developed um, by Lawrence Lessig at, at Stanford a number of years ago, and he has uh, really led a movement that has helped us change the way we think about copyrights. Um, and most of you, and, and myself included, uh, all the years I've, I've ever created materials, I always put the C with the circle after it, and that means all rights reserved. And uh, his idea was that you don't have to reserve all the rights. In fact, if you want it to be distributed more wide widely, you shouldn't reserve all the rights. You should reserve some of the rights. Um, and so uh, this movement uh, called Creative Commons was initiated, which allows you to think about which rights you want to reserve and which rights you don't want to reserve. Um, in fact, there are uh, a lot of uh, different copyrights. This is the one that University of Michigan puts on all of its uh, uh, online materials, and Michigan's put their entire uh, medical school curriculum up. Um, but here it is right here. It's instead of a C with a circle, it's got two C's in a circle. And in this case, they're asking you to always uh, let people know, if you ever use this, who created this, in this case, Matt Velke, uh, that uh, they don't want you to use it to make money, that's non-commercial, and share alike, which means if you're going to use this, you need to use this using the same license that they have. Um, it's an example of how you might do it. Now, there are a variety of iterations of those things uh, that you can use. In fact, there's uh, too many. It's probably too small for people to see. But there's a variety of different Creative Commons licenses that you can put on material, some of which is uh, basically saying it's, uh, that there is no uh, license at all because it's fallen out of uh, copyright. Others in which you say, well, you know, I, I don't care. Use it for what you want. Just, just say it came from me, and I don't care. That's, uh, that's the, the Creative Commons, what's called by, just uh, right there, Creative Commons attribution. It just says, you can use it. Just, just remember to tell people that I'm the, I'm the person who created it. Or maybe if you're, really, if you're really nervous about what you write, you, you do the zero waiver, which is, you know, it's, you can use it, but please don't tell anyone that it was mine. <laughs> um, you might want to do that. Uh, uh, the, the process of doing that, you know, you think about it, you could take all your PowerPoints and all your lectures and all your videos and all your interactive educational materials and, and turn them into open source materials. You can, you can look at the copyrights of all the images that you've selected um, uh, and uh, edit all the materials that you've created, educational materials, so that the whole world could use them. Um, you see, we work mostly, at least in North America, under the idea that the material we create and we use in a closed classroom uh, falls under fair use law which allows me to steal whatever images I want and use in this classroom um, because uh, it's a closed setting and it's for educational purposes only. And again, I'm not, I'm not getting any money for being here and giving the talk today. So um, I can use pretty much anything I want. But if I'm going to make it freely available on the internet, that's a completely different thing. And if I take an image and it's from Elsevier, one of the pub big publishers, and put it up there, then Elsevier can come after me and say, wait a second, you're distributing my materials that I have the copyright for uh, and, and, and uh, come after me for that. Um, and so the challenge then for faculty is to take materials that you've already created and make them open source. Um, and that does take a little bit of effort. Uh, in, at MIT, uh, they have a whole shop. Uh, of people who take educational materials from their faculty and convert them by replacing images, by going off and getting approvals from copyright organizations to create the materials that they want. Um, that's a very expensive process, very expensive process. And so a guy named Joseph Harden at University of Michigan came up with this idea of the digital scribe, the describe. And describes are students. They're, they're the, 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 for, you know, like when I was in med school, there's a front row of students who would, we paid everybody to take notes. Uh, and then publish those notes. Those are the scribes. Well, these are digital scribes. These are students who uh, are either paid at student rates, which is a lot less than faculty, or unpaid, um, maybe for course credit or just to, to suck up to the faculty, which sometimes they do, uh, to uh, engage a little bit deeper in the material than the, than, than the usual student. And the describe process is one in which a student takes the material from the faculty um, and then uh, uh, looks, for example, at the 40 PowerPoint slides that came as part of the lecture and identifies from within it which items have copyrights and which don't. And then students, as you know, are, are very facile, more than I am, uh, at using the internet and searching for things. They're not going to pay a penny for anything you can get for free. All the images that, that are in pretty much any PowerPoint presentations I've seen um, can be found for free, or at least a decent replacement on the internet. And students know how to do it. We have some tools that we've developed for them to do it. We have some training now that got developed uh, by Ted Hans and uh, folks at, at University of Michigan to train people to essentially do this at rapid fire. 
Um, and that's how they've been able to convert the entire uh, first and second year medical school curriculum to online open source materials by using this relatively straightforward process um, that they developed. And so they've got the whole, uh, this is the first year medical school curriculum, which is free to anybody in the room. You can go to the open.umich.edu and uh, pick up the entire first and second year curriculum, uh, watch every PowerPoint slide, watch every, uh, there are some videos in there. Um, and a number of educational uh, activities that you can find.